want to introduce Michelle Tams, who is a Wilderness Day N with the Society for Wilderness Stewardship. And she lives in Washington. She's worked for the Society for Wilderness Stewardship since 2020. And she's done a lot of work with wilderness character monitoring, wilderness character baselines in the Pacific Northwest. And she and I have worked together uh, for most of that time, and it's been great. Um, and she also has worked on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest and graduated from Western Washington University with a self-design major in environmental science and society with minors in biology and Spanish. And she loves wilderness and is an avid backcountry skier and North Cascades enthusiast. And she enjoys long walks in the mountains and she loves to nerd out on the natural world. So we will um, get started on the title of her talk is Wilderness Character and Wilderness Character Monitoring. And Michelle, take it away. Thanks so much, Nancy, and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Super appreciate it. Um, as Nancy mentioned, today my session will be focused on wilderness character and wilderness character monitoring. Um, at the tail end of the presentation, I'm going to be emphasizing uh, specifically the Forest Services Wilderness Character Monitoring Program. But aside from that, most of this content is relevant for all four land management agencies that steward wilderness. Like Nancy mentioned, I've worked for SWS for about three years now, specifically in the Pacific Northwest region. So Washington and Oregon is really what I know best. Okay, so briefly providing an overview of today's session, I'm gonna give a background of the Wilderness Act, and then we're gonna detail the five qualities of wilderness character together. Um, and then we're gonna be talking a little bit about the development of the definition of wilderness character. And then, like I mentioned, we're going to be diving a bit deeper into wilderness character monitoring, specifically in the Forest Service. So before the Wilderness Act was passed in 1964, there was a time period of political unrest. Um, we have, of course, the civil rights movement, as well as growing concern about uh, the environment and what was being done to protect it. Um, there was concerns about technological advances changing um, the natural landscape, as well as impacts to water and air quality, and a growing concern that there weren't going to be any lands in the U.S. that would may, remain wild and free. So up until this point, there were none of these things listed on the slide here in front of you. We had no national policy to preserve wilderness, um, no uniform definition of wilderness, no nationwide system of areas protected as wilderness, no uniform management guidance, and no commitment to preserve wilderness in perpetuity. And then in 1964, the Wilderness Act was signed. And it was signed only four months after the Act's primary author, Lord Zahn Eiser, passed away. Um, and the Act established a national wilderness preservation system. Um, we'll go into more detail here shortly about the phrase wilderness character, which is essential to our talk today and our understanding of wilderness. Um, but wilderness character is mentioned in two different sections in the Act, section 2A and section 4B. So in section 2A, we know this portion of the Act as a statement of policy. Um, it states that wilderness is for the use and enjoyment of the American people, and that managers shall manage for the preservation of wilderness character. And then in section 4B, we have the mandate, which states wilderness character and its preservation twice here. And I wanted to just um, pull out these two sections of the act to highlight and underscore how the preservation of wilderness character is a central component of the wilderness act. And so it's mentioned three times throughout the act. And we're going to dive a little deeper into what wilderness character is next. So wilderness character is described in the act using a five 
the, excuse me, the five tangible qualities of what we now call wilderness character. They're all described in section 2C. So we have the untrammeled, undeveloped, natural, outstanding opportunities for solitude or a primitive and unconfined creation and other features of value qualities. And next we're going to go into more depth about each one of these qualities. So first we have the untrammeled quality. The act states that wilderness is an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. And initially there was debate over whether or not to use the specific word in the act, um, untrammeled, but Zonizer thought it was perfect for what they were trying to do. Untrammeled essentially means not subjected to human controls or manipulation that hamper the free play of natural forces. Um, another way to think about this is that untrammeled is wild. The opposite would be trammel or to trammel, um, which is something that restricts free movement. And it's really important to note that there are two concepts um, inherent in this quality. One is restraint and another is intentionality. So restraint is essentially when managers choose not to interfere with the wilderness ecosystem, and intentionality refers to actions that deliberately interfere with, manage, or control an aspect of wilderness ecosystem. And I also wanted to acknowledge that you know some of us may be reading this excerpt from the Wilderness Act and be thinking that that's not exactly what sits with your current interpretation of wilderness. And um, there is active work being done to reevaluate aspects of this quality because it has historically removed indigenous peoples from their homelands. And wilderness practitioners are working to reinterpret this to include forms of traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous life ways within the existing framework of the wilderness. So this is an exercise we're all going to get comfortable with um, over the next couple qualities here. I'm going to ask you whether it's on a piece of paper on your own or just mentally, think about some examples that would degrade this quality. Um, so what degrades the untrammeled or wild aspects of wilderness? And I'll give you a few seconds just to think about it or again, jot it down on a piece of paper on your own. And then we'll go over some examples together. Um, and for time's sake, we're going to start by just going through some examples of things that uh, degrade the untrammeled quality. Essentially, the untrammeled quality is degraded by actions and structures that intentionally manipulate the biophysical environment. They are they fall into two categories: authorized and unauthorized actions. First, let's talk about some examples of authorized actions that degrade this quality. Things like active fire suppression. So in the bottom left photo there. Um, that's an example of fire retardant being dropped on a fire to control how it burns or to press it in its entirety. Um, applying herbicide to non indigenous plants is a form of trammeling, as well as um, releasing acorn sheep in this example here. So, any sort of act to reintroduce native species can qualify as a trammeling action. And then things like fish stocking or installing um, structures like this one here, kind of in the left middle, which are, which is a structure to protect um, turtle nests or things like felling trees to intentionally alter the forest ecosystem. Um, and then some unauthorized action examples are things that are not authorized by the managing agency. So something like an illegal marijuana grow site or unauthorized fish stocking um, or setting an arson fire. All of these things intentionally manipulate the ecosystem, whether they're authorized or not. And one thing I want to mention too is that you may be thinking to yourself that it looks like all these things at least authorized are um, either protected in the Wilderness Act or are protected by agency policy. And that may be true. And even though they're allowed, um, they may still have the capacity to alter the distribution of species or change the wilderness ecosystem, thereby qualifying as a trammel action or degrading. 
Okay, so the next quality we're going to go over is the undeveloped. And the act states that wilderness is undeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation. I think for me, this quality is one of the easiest ones to kind of connect to in my mind because a lot of what affects the undeveloped quality is concrete, things like permanent improvements or installations. So the presence of those things have the capacity to degrade this quality. So again, on your own, on a piece of paper, think about some things that would degrade this quality with some specifics. I'll give you a moment to think about that before we go into some examples. Okay, so the undeveloped quality is degraded by all those things listed on the page here. So things like the presence of non-recreational structures, installations and developments, the presence of inholdings, active or residual evidence of mining, use of motor vehicles, motorized equipment or mechanical transport. So all these things on the screen here have the capacity to degrade the undeveloped quality. You can see the presence of, you know, a truck and a border fence being installations as well as motor vehicles degrading this quality, the presence of an airplane, um, the presence of scientific equipment or culverts or mine adits all can degrade this quality. The next quality we're going to touch on is the natural quality. The act states that wilderness generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature, with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticeable. And this quality is measured by how free the ecological conditions are from the effects of modern civilization. So one thing I wanted to note is that there's a difference between the untrammeled and natural qualities. The untrammeled quality tends to measure actions, and the natural quality tends to measure effects. So again, let's think about some examples of things that degrade this quality. Give you a few moments to think about it. Okay, great. So the natural quality is degraded by the presence of invasive species, changes in air or water quality, um, resource development, and commercial livestock grazing. It's also degraded by the loss of indigenous species and occurrence of non-native species, alteration of ecological processes such as water flows and fire regimes. So some examples you see in front of you are things like um, invasive buffalo grass and Canada thistle, kind of on the left side of the screen. The presence of invasive feral pigs or zebra mussels, so non indigenous animals. Um, commercial cattle grazing there at the bottom can degrade the natural quality because grazing in general has the capacity to affect this quality in a multitude of ways. Increasing haze to, can degrade this quality. Um, those are all examples of things that can kind of detract from the natural quality. Um, in general, the untrammeled quality uh, measures the intentionality to alter the wilderness ecosystem, whereas the natural quality measures possibly the impact of those decisions and actions made. So, um, what would qualify as a tramway action would be the installation of, let's see. Let's see, I'll go back to fish stocking. Actually. That's a pretty tangible example to touch on. Um, so fish stocking itself, the act of doing so, degrades the untrammeled quality because there's intent uh, to alter the distribution and abundance of species in a wilderness. And there is a decision that managers could restrain from imposing that action. So it's got both that intentionality and restraint component we were kind of touching on, whereas natural would be 
measuring things like the presence of non-indigenous fish. So the action from trammel versus natural quality. Hope that helps a little bit. Um, thanks for the question. So we've got two more qualities to cover. This one is the outstanding opportunities for solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation quality. The language is pulled directly from the act here. And there are three parts to this quality. We have solitude, which is the remoteness from the sights and sounds of people, both inside and outside of the wilderness. Primitive recreation. So that would be the absence of recreational facilities that decrease the opportunity for self-reliant recreation. And then thirdly, unconfined recreation, which is the absence of management restrictions restriction using a visitor behavior. So here, let's think about some examples that would degrade this quality. And if you're not totally sure about this quality yet, that's all right, we're gonna cover some examples. He would just give you a moment to think about what might impact this quality. Okay, so things that degrade this quality are things like human activity inside wilderness, facilities that decrease self-reliant recreation, and management restri restrictions on visitor behavior. So things that affect the solitude component of this quality would be things like increased visitor encounter, like that photo on the far left of the stone, that decreases the feeling of solid, as well as things like um, seeing cruise ships from, you know, in Alaska, a lot of times there are cruise ships that are allowed to go up waterways where folks are in the wilderness on the shoreline and they can see this presence of other people, which detracts from their solitude experience. Um, examples of things that are like facilities that decrease self-reliant recreation, or the installation of bridges or backcountry toilets, and then things that um, degrade or degrade the unconfined recreation piece are things like management restrictions on visitor behavior, such as a quota system. So um, a permit quota system is interesting because it can both enhance the feeling of solitude by reducing the number of people out on the landscape, reducing the number of folks you're going to encounter but it also detracts from a piece of this quality because it um, confines recreation. Similar situation with party size. So you'll notice that for the outstanding opportunities for solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation quality, that some of these items conflict with one another. And the last quality of wilderness character is other features of value. The act states that wilderness may contain ecological, geological, or other features of scientific, educational, scenic, or historical value. So examples of other features of value are things like unique and iconic geological um, features or petroglyphs and archaeological sites. Generally, something in a wilderness qualifies as an other features of value if it is called out in the designating legislation or it's iconic to the wilderness, such as the, the name of the wilderness is named after this feature, that sort of thing. So given those examples of other features that I just shared, maybe let's all think about for the last time, what are some examples of things that would degrade those other features? Okay, great. So this quality is degraded when there is deterioration or loss of integral cultural features or integral site-specific features. So that's something like, you know, graffiti over um, petroglyphs or the crumbling of iconic rock features or the receding of masses and well-known glaciers due to climate change. So those sorts of things can all degrade the features of And another piece of um, defining wilderness character in the act is that um, 
there's this component here that has to do with the size of a wilderness. So the act states that wilderness has at least 5,000 acres of land or is of sufficient size to make practicable its preservation use in an unimpaired condition. And I really wanted to highlight this excerpt because it has this piece, this you know, really important syntax use, which is or. This size or is, is of sufficient size. And the reason that the original authors of the act included this is because they wanted to ensure that um, even smaller portions of land could be protected. As so here's an example of the Pelican Island Wilderness, which is managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and is five and a half acres in size. But if we didn't have this or in the act, some of these extremely small wildlife refuges would not have been designated. So this is a really important piece to just draw attention. And proceeding through the Wilderness Act, Section 4C is the prohibition of certain uses. So those um, uses are listed here on the screen, things like commercial enterprise, permanent road, temporary road, use of motor vehicles, motorized equipment, motorboats, landing of aircraft, mechanical transport, structure or installation are all included in these prohibited uses. However, there are some exceptions. So, some or all of these prohibited uses can be exempted by special provisions in the Wilderness Act, an existing private right, or subsequent legislation. So most of the prohibited uses in that previous screen can be exempted if we can demonstrate that it is both necessary to the administration of the area as wilderness and the minimum activity. And this is the genesis of the minimum requirement analysis or MRP piece which is something that Ken Straley is going to be talking about more in depth after this presentation. So I highly recommend checking that out. This is something you'd like to learn more about. And another section in the Wilderness Act are special provisions. So where some of these non-conforming uses have already become established, they may be permitted to continue. So an example of that would be cattle grazing or commercial livestock grazing. And so essentially the concept behind this is that where an, a use was occurring prior to wilderness designation, it may be allowed to continue under one of these special provisions. Other examples of those special provisions are included on the screen here. Um, just kind of summing things up when it comes to wilderness character and how, how it relates to the Wilderness Act. Um, there's another aspect of wilderness character, which is, which are the intangible valuable and values, excuse me, things like personal experiences, symbolic meetings. So your sense of renewal, that you come back from a wilderness venture, feeling the sense of inspiration. Those are all intangible values that wilderness provides and are inherent in our understanding of wilderness character, but are not as easily quantifiable. Um, and what may become very clear as I just kind of explained answering Ray's question is that managers are considering how wilderness character is affected in a multitude of ways with one action or one project. So even one project may improve one aspect of wilderness character, excuse me, one quality of wilderness character, but it might also degrade another quality. So managers are always asking these big questions and measuring the cumulative effect of a, a management action or project on the impact. And I just want to underscore that if you are able to protect the five tangible qualities we just went over, you will protect the intangibles as well. Okay, so diving in a little bit deeper here. So even though there are five tangible qualities of wilderness character, the Wilderness Act doesn't actually offer us a definition of wilderness character. So there have been attempts through the years of the land management agencies to hone in on a unified understanding. 
Here we have the cover pages of three important documents to keep in mind. In 2005, the Forest Service came out with the left hand um, cover page here. It was one of the first iterations to develop a wilderness character monitoring uh, framework to understand how wilderness character could be changing over time. Later on in 2008, Keeping It Wild came out. This was uh, the initial interagency strategy agreed upon by the four land management agencies that manage congressional wilderness. So those are the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and National Park Service. Later on in 2015, an updated version called Keeping It Wild 2 came out, which provides the most up-to-date interagency strategy to monitor trends in wilderness across the four agencies. Great, so within Keeping It Wild 2, we have an, agree, an agreed upon definition of wilderness character. It is a holistic concept based on the interaction of biophysical environments, free from modern human manipulation and impact, personal experiences and natural environments, relatively free from the unencumbrances and signs of modern society, and symbolic meanings of humility, restraint, and interdependence that inspire human connection with nature. Taken together, these tangible and intangible values define wilderness character and distinguish wilderness from all other. So what's important to note is that this definition of wilderness character in Keeping It Wild 2 has been used to develop practical monitoring protocols on the ground. So like I've been mentioning, Keeping It Wild 2 is the interagency monitoring strategy, but it doesn't actually define agency-specific responsibilities for implementing that strategy. So there are agency-specific documents that have been written that cover the protocols and step-by-step -step details of actually implementing wilderness character monitoring. So the photo on the right here is really important because Keeping It Wild 2 provides this national consistency for the definition and understanding of wilderness character. Those five qualities we've detailed earlier, monitoring questions and indicators. But that last box on the bottom is agency specific. So those measures, the ways that agencies are actually collecting data and monitoring over time is specific to each group, which we'll go into a little more in depth here. So in addition to preserving wilderness character as a legal requirement of the Wilderness Act, I also wanted to share some of the agency policies for the four land management agencies that steward wilderness in accordance with that. So we have um, legal and policy mandates to improve wilderness care and bring it more closely in line with the requirements offered by the Act. Okay, so here we are at wilderness character monitoring. So wilderness character monitoring or WCM helps us manage for wilderness character. So in this slide here, I have the cover pages of guiding documents for each one of the land management agencies that manages wilderness. So we'll start on the left with the Forest Service. The Forest Service has the 2020 Wilderness Character Monitoring Technical Guide. The BLM has the Implementation Guide, which is on its 2.0 version. The National Park Service has locally developed wilderness character monitoring protocols for each park that are based off of Keeping It Wild in the National Park Service and Wilderness Stewardship Plan Handbook. And then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uses the survey protocol framework for monitoring wilderness character on national wildlife refuges, which was published in 2019. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to be focused in on wilderness character monitoring in the Forest Service, but I also just want to highlight here that each one of the other three land management agencies has their own guiding documents and processes for implementing wilderness character monitoring. And at the end of the presentation, I'll share my contact information. So if you'd like to learn more about how the BLM 
the NPS or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service implement WCM, feel free to contact me and you in, in um, connection with them. I can help you. Okay, I know I'm in the last five minutes here, so I'm going to skim through a little bit quick. So apologies for how fast I'm going, folks. But here's a little more in-depth information about the technical guide for the Forest Service. It provides the Forest Service a strategy and methodology for monitoring trends in wilderness character that are consistent with keeping a wild too. This document is about 400 pages in length. And for the Forest Service, a baseline assessment report is written as part of wilderness character monitoring in accordance with protocols outlined in the technical guide. And then going into the future, the same data is collected using those same protocols on five-year increments. And for the Forest Service, there are 28 standardized measures to select from. Each unit must select at least 15 measures to collect data and assess trends over time. So here is a screenshot of the measures, standardized measures of the Forest Service. 10 of these measures are required. 14 are required to select at least one. Two are required if relevant, and two are optional. I want to make a plug here too that units have the option, if so relevant, to develop locally developed measures. So if there are aspects of wilderness character or a specific wilderness area that are not represented on this table here, units have the option to develop um, a protocol specific to monitoring that aspect. So for the Forest Service, here's a cover of the, a template of the Wilderness Character Baseline Assessment Report. The report when completed is about 100 pages in length. Once the data is compiled into the report, it is entered into two locations. One is in the upper left, which is a Forest Service specific database called NRM, WCM. And the bottom left is the Interagency Wilderness Character Monitoring Database. So the Interagency Wilderness Character Monitoring Database, or IWCMD, is a centralized location for all four um, federal land management agencies that steward wilderness to input their data based on measures and protocols outlined in their specific guidance documents. So this is a centralized location for all um, agencies to compile data. Based off of data entered into the IWCMD, five-year assessments and trend reports are um, created. So trend reports are when we basically recollect the data five years later, and the IWCMD spits out a trend assessment. And after you have enough data points on these five-year increments, we can assess potential changes to wilderness character. So these tools help us answer the question, is wilderness character being preserved? And essentially in these boxes and arrows on the right side of the screen, you can see how this cycle of completing the assessment and trend reports, entering data and analyzing the data can affect management actions in the wilderness. So diving deeper into trends specifically, each measure may have a different trend, whether it's improving, stable, or degrading, um, respective of each one of those arrows. So here is a table of an overall trend assessment. So each measure's trend is determined initially, and that's based off of those data points I was talking about. You have a baseline data point, and every five years after that, the data is recollected, and then the change or um, stability of the data is assessed. We aggregate the trends into an ultimate overall wilderness character trend. So for this example, the wilderness character in this example wilderness is improving. And the rules for aggregating these trends are on the left side of the screen here. Um, I'm sure this PowerPoint will be available to you after this presentation. Feel free to dive into that deeper when you have a chance on your own time. And so once we have trends in wilderness character for each wilderness, 
then within a region, we can assess how wilderness character is changing for a specific wilderness or a group of wilderness areas, and then on a regional level as well. And on a national level, we can see how regionally wilderness character is changing and nationally how we're doing as wilderness managers. And with that, feel free to ask any questions in the remaining short minutes I've saved for this portion. Otherwise, feel free to contact me. I have two email addresses there. Um, you can reach out to either. One is my Society for Wilderness Stewardship email. The other is my Forest Service email account. Again, just want to reiterate, if you are conducting wilderness character monitoring for um, any of the four land management agencies and have residual questions, you can reach out to me and I can distribute those accordingly. So thanks so much, everyone, for your time. Thanks again, Michelle, so much. Great presentation. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.